Go. All right. Yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> so um, it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome Florian Wenzel today, uh, who joined us remotely from Berlin in Germany. Uh, so Florian did his PhD in Berlin at the uh, Humboldt University, and I had the great pleasure to actually uh, work with him since 2014, I believe, or 2015. So it's been a long-term collaborator of mine. Um, so he did his PhD with Marius Kloft there, and then later also with, um, uh, with Manfred Opper um, at the Technical University in Berlin. And since the fall of 2019, he actually joined Google in Berlin, uh, Google Brain, and has been working with the Brain team there on different aspects of Bayesian deep learning connecting to his, um, to his PhD. Um, and in particular, uh, Florian is going to talk about his uh, paper on cold posteriors and the effect that Bayesian deep learning not necessarily always works better. It only works better when you do something specific to the temperature uh, of that Bayesian posterior. So I actually look forward to hear more about this interesting line of research. And with that, I'll just hand it over to Florian. Cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here today and having the opportunity to talk about reliable deep learning. So as uh, Stefan already said, um, I'm going to talk about um, one paper about the cold posterior effect um, and in the first part of the talk. And in the second part, I actually want to also talk about another paper, uh, hyperparameter ensemble. So, these two papers um, I've worked on during my postdoc at Google Brain. Uh, <clears throat> so deep learning is amazing. Um, we have self-driving cars um, which protect, uh, detect pedestrians and traffic signs, but deep learning also fails. So if you take this traffic sign and you add some noise to it, it could be that the deep net uh, predicts a stop sign instead of a speed limit sign with high confidence. Also, um, if uh, in the deployed system, you encounter traffic signs that look different to the traffic signs in your train set, like if you have uh, stickers on it or graffiti, could be that your deep net predicts the wrong, with, wrong thing with high confidence. So deep learning methods achieve amazing accuracy on benchmark data sets like Cypher 10. But if you take the same network which you trade there, and apply it to slightly different images, like here, uh, street view house numbers, uh, the network predicts completely wrong labels with high confidence. So in general, deep learning often achieves amazing results when the test data is similarly distributed as the trade data. But in, in the real world, we often have distribution shifts. So that can, for example, happen for, for the street view storefronts I've shown here. So uh, a gas station looks different um, over time. And also uh, they change, the appearance changed geographically. So a gas station in Germany looks different than in the US. Um, in a recent paper, Ovadi et al benchmark recent deep learning methods that can deal with uncertainty. Um, and they took those uh, ImageNet examples and applied certain, um, certain corruptions to it, like blurred the images or added some noise. And here in this plot on the x-axis, you see the corruption intensity and on the y-axis, the accuracy. You can see for all those uh, deep learning methods tested here, the accuracy drops uh, with increased corruptions. Um, but uh, like an important question is if those models actually know that they are less accurate. And to answer this question, we can look at the expected calibration error. Um, and here you can see that with increased corruptions, um, the models become less uh, calibrated. So they make mistakes with high confidence. In safety critical applications like self-driving cars or health this is very problematic. And here we need reliable deep learning methods. So we need uh, models that know when they know, don't know. So we can trust its predictions. Uh, we need reliable methods for better decision making, especially if we have um, like um, high cost for false positives. Uh, it's important for applications like open set recognition, where we might have um, classes in the test data that are not present in the trade data, and we have to detect those examples. And also in active learning, um, having reliable uncertainty estimates is uh, quite beneficial because we want to require um, data in regions where the model is uncertain. 
So in this um, talk, I won't solve the whole issue, but I, I promise you that you will learn some approaches that make deep learning a little bit more robust and hopefully even a bit, whoops, even a bit more amazing. So uh, let's start with some approaches to reliable deep learning. Um, here's a list of a few. Uh, they are like based on neural networks. Um, then we have deep generative models, Gaussian processes, and especially their connection to neural nets. We have uh, data augmentation techniques. Um, we have heuristic methods like temperature scaling, uh, methods like Monte Carlo dropout, um, ensembles over deep networks, and many more. In this talk, I want to focus on two of those areas. In the first half of the talk, uh, I'm going to um, focus on based on neural networks. So here we are interested in the posterior distribution of the weights given the data. And BNNs um, come with great promises since they are principled approach to uncertainty representation. And it comes with nice um, theory. On the other hand, um, inference is quite challenging and expensive. Uh, in this talk, uh, we, we face the following problem. So given those great promises, BNNs are rarely used in practice. Why is that? So in, in this talk, we, we show that they actually can, it's, it's actually really hard to make them better than uh, simple baselines. But if you apply some tricks, like cooling down the posterior, can we actually can make them work. But still, this uh, points to fundamental problems, and I'm going to discuss those. In the second half of the talk, um, <clears throat> I focus on ensembles. So here we take a different approach and we just consider um, a, a standard neural network architecture strange from different initializations. Uh, this is simple and works quite well in practice, but it's also quite expensive. And in this talk, I'm um, asking the question if we can actually improve the improve deep ensembles by leveraging other sources of diversity. And I'm also going to talk about how to make it efficient in the end. In the end, I will give a quick outlook. All right, let's dive into BNNs. So the following is based on a recent ISML paper with all those amazing collaborators, among them, for example, Stefan. Um, so in based on deep learning, um, the goal is to, to compute the base posterior of a deep net. And we hope that this improves robustness of the predictions. And so this is a quite active research field, but most of the recent work um, uh, focuses on improving the approximate inference techniques. So um, to get closer to the true base posterior. There's like many amazing papers in the last years coming up with better inference methods. But in this talk, um, I want to ask a different question. Is the, actually, is the actual base posterior good? So um, to, to answer this question, let's start with BNNs. So here I show you, you a standard neural network first. Uh, typically, we, we take a deep net to parameterize the likelihood function, like for a classification, we would take a categorical likelihood and um, which is given by, by a soft max parameterized by the neural network. And in the end, we want to, to get a single parameter vector theta, which uh, works well. Uh, in a basic network, however, we are interested in a distribution over likely models given the data. So um, again, in standard deep learning, we would optimize a loss function. Like here, that would be um, a log posterior, like a log, log likelihood term and a regularizer given by the log prior term. And then we find uh, an optimal, or locally optimal solution. Um, in neural networks, based on neural networks, um, we sample from the posterior. Uh, like we get this, these samples, theta one, theta two, theta three, and so on. And then we can take those samples to compute the predictive distribution. So in the end, we average the pr predictions of all those different models. Um, and in this talk, I will consider 
a model to be good if it predicts well. So if it, for example, um, attains low cross entropy loss in the end. All right. So I already said BNNs come with uh, great promises. Um, we hope that they are robust in generalization because we average over many different models. We expect BNNs to lead to better to lead to better uncertainty quantifications. So those models know when they don't know. And we hope that BNNs lead to new deep learning applications like continual learning, sequential decision making, and so on. But in practice, BNNs are rarely used. And it's even worse. Um, base, the base first here is actually often even worse than a single SGD point estimate. So why would, should we use this more expensive method if it's actually worse than the, the standard baseline? In, in the paper we show, and also others uh, have shown that, that you can make it work by considering what we call the cold posterior. So this is actually like the standard posterior, just with this additional temperature parameter T. So if you uh, take T equals one, you get back the original, or these the, the true standard base posterior. Uh, but for temperatures smaller than one, we sharpen the posterior. So this can be interpreted as overcounting the evidence. Um, so the, these cold posteriors are explicitly or sometimes implicitly used by most of the recent phase and deep learning papers. Let's see how it looks um, in this uh, uh, cartoon. So as you can see, if we decrease the temperature, the, the um, probability mass becomes more actually quite well. So here um, in the top plot, we have a ResNet um, train on C10. Uh, on the x-axis, we have uh, temperatures uh, from one and going to the left, we, we have lower temperatures um, down to 10 to the minus four. And we plot the prediction performance as function as temperature. Um, and as you, can, as you can see, for temperature equals one, so this is the true base posterior, the performance is actually worse than the baseline given by SGD. But if we decrease the temperature, um, the, the performance becomes much better. And a similar tendency holds for CN and LSTM on the IMDB data set. Um, are you actually still here? I guess my internet connection. Okay. No, okay. I, I can't hear you, but okay, cool. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so it works quite well, but we still think there's a big problem uh, because um, cooling down the posterior sharply deviates from the base and paradigm. And in our uh, um, opinion, this points to a fundamental problem which we think is important to explore if we want to make further progress in based and deep learning. So in the end, what is the use of better inference methods if the actual posterior is poor? So in the paper, we discuss a couple of different hypotheses which could explain that. So we, we look into potential problems with the inference algorithm. Um, we look at potential problems with the likelihood. Like in uh, modern deep net architectures, we use techniques like batch normalization, dropout, and data augmentation. And all of these uh, lead to uh, non proper likelihood functions. So maybe this causes the problem. And we also look into problems with the prior. So unfortunately, I can't discuss all the topics here. Uh, but to already give you a spoiler, we find that problems with the prior are most likely uh, linked to the cold posterior effect. And in the paper, I concentrate on, on three hypotheses. Uh, so first I talk about inference and then about the prior. All right, inference, is it accurate enough? Um, so how do we do inference in basic neural networks? Um, in our paper, we uh, focus on stochastic gradient Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Um, so they typically work best. That's why we focus on them. There are also other techniques like uh, variation inference, uh, which 
are harder to, to make work for BMMs. So, so here in the paper, we really want to get the best results in the end, but we don't care so much uh, about speed. Um, so the question is, um, if inaccurate inference actually leads to the cold posterior effect. So let's see how it works. Um, first, let's start with SGD again. So here we, we optimize a loss. Well, this, this is now uh, shown as the negative loss, so we would uh, maximize it. And you can see, um, yeah, we, we end up at, at, at a certain location, which is the local optimal. And SGMCMC, uh, we have a similar trajectory, uh, more details later. And along this tra trajectory, we um, collect samples. And in the end, we know that those samples will, will come approximately from the, from, uh, from the posterior. So um, I don't go into details here. So here's like uh, just a one slide refresher on long term dynamics, which are the core of a stochastic graded mark of J. Monte Carlo. So we have a stochastic differential equation of the parameters theta and the momentum m. And if we simulate this SDE, we get a distribution which is proportional to the tempered posterior. So this looks quite complicated, uh, but in the end, it's actually quite simple. So to solve this SDE, we can discretize it. And here we, we show you a symplectic Euler scheme. And, and using this, this actually looks quite uh, similar as SGD. In fact, um, this yellow part is just SGD with momentum. And the green part is an additional term um, given by Gaussian noise scaled by the temperature. All right. So um, because we use a discretization scheme, we only get approximate samples from the posterior. So the question is, is it accurate enough? In general, it's really hard to assess, assess the quality of samples. Um, so here we, we started with a simplified setting and we uh, generated synthetic data from a MLP. Um, so on the left plot, we applied uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which could be considered as the gold standard for, for basing posterior sampling. And so we used uh, as the, the same MLP architecture to fit a basin neural network to the data using um, HMC. And we used a couple of different diagnostics to really make sure that those samples um, are close to the true posterior. And in this plot, we, we have like three different MLPs of depth one, two, and three. And we plot the prediction performance, the cross entropy as function of the temperature. Okay, and on the right hand, hand side, we uh, use the same data and the same architecture, but now we apply SGMCMC to it. And again, plot the performance as function of, of as, as function of temperature. And as you can see, um, the final performance is quite similar to, to HMC. And only for small temperatures, they differ a little bit. So this already gives us some confidence that SGMC MC can, can uh, produce high quality samples if you really wait long enough to until convergence. Um, so in the we have a couple of more experiments and uh, some diagnostics. So in the end, we we we, we end up with the um, uh, conclusion that only problems with the inference um, don't uh, cause the cold posterior effect. So there has to be more to it. All right, uh, I already said there's like some, some diagnostics we used. Um, and let's look at this plot again. Uh, there's actually something else interesting to read, read off. Um, if you look carefully, you see that here actually temperature one performs best. And so we think this is the case because here the model is well specified. We use the same model to fit the data as we uh, generated the data with. But in the real world, uh, we have seen the temperatures lower than one are better. So this um, leads to the idea that maybe there's a problem with the uh, specification of, of our BNN. And a good starting point for that is to look at the prior. 
So in most Bayesian neural network uh, work, like for modern deep network architectures, um, there's the standard Gaussian prior used. Okay, but let's let's see if this is actually prior. Um, to answer this question, we can look at the induced predictive distribution. So the idea is that we just draw um, like a parameter from the prior and then we look at induced class probabilities even before looking at the training data. And then we can, can plot the distribution of class probabilities and we can see how it looks. So draw, different draws from the prior would lead to this different distribution of class probabilities. Okay, so let's do it for, for our actual ResNet20 on the Cypher 10 data set. Um, so, so here we draw on one parameter from the Gaussian prior and plot the class probabilities. And you can see all the classes are mapped to, to the label nine. Draw from the prior almost all the data class to class nine again. A couple of times and we first work from the limit and reflect our about I'm sorry, Florian, are you can you hear me? Um, the connection is unfortunately really poor. So why don't you try maybe switching off your video just in case? Maybe it helps. Okay. Let's see. And just Unfortunately, now you're frozen completely. Um, okay, uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, this is this is a good start. Let's try it again. Okay, sorry about that. Somehow my my connection is a bit laggy today. Um, let me know. If again. Okay, so uh, so are you still here? Because I can't see you anymore. Yes, we're here, but we you, you still have to share. Your, so. You still have to share your screen. Ah, I see. Oh, sorry. Okay. So can you see the slide again? This looks good. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. All right. So we. Uh, Ended up the ended with those um, draws from from the prior predictive distribution, and we have seen that essentially all the networks are mapped to to one class, uh, which is clearly problematic. So now the question is: Is there an easy fix to this problem? So maybe we can just adjust the variance of the Gaussian prior, and we've done that and uh, considered different prior variances. Uh, and looked at the predictive distributions. They looked a little bit better, but, but in the end, as you can see in this plot, the cold posterior effect is still here for all variances considered. Um, so then there's another interesting observation. Um, the cold posterior effect tends to become stronger with increasing capacity. So, we look at different MLPs again on the left plot, an MLP of depth three, and we varied the width uh, from 32 to 256. Uh, and with increasing width, um, the post cold posterior effect becomes stronger. And a similar tendency holds for depth on the right hand side. Okay, so, so let me summarize here. Um, in our paper, we, we try to um, explain um, the cold posterior effect. So uh, in the end, we, we, we formulated a couple of hypotheses and we found that the inference methods are probably accurate enough, but at least they alone, or problems with the inference alone cannot uh, fully explain um, this behavior. 
And so we find that there are most likely problems with the priors. And we hope uh, or we argue that, that we should uh, look more into that and, and uh, yeah, trying to come up with better priors and architectures in general that work better with um, Bayesian posterior SAM. So ultimately, we, we hope that our <coughs> work inspires uh, new research on understanding the ends better. And after presenting our work at ICML uh, 2020, uh, we are quite happy that there are already a, a couple of nice papers um, providing new uh, perspectives on the cold posterior effect. So for example, there's a paper by Ed Adlam et al, uh, which um, argued that BNNs overestimate the electric uncertainty and the cold posterior effect corrects for that. Um, there's a recent or well, current IPR submission where the authors argue that common likelihood functions don't reflect um, that current or like that our benchmark data sets are highly curated. So they only um, contain clean examples. And this is connected to the cold posterior effect. In a current AABI submission, the authors design better priors motivated by some empirical findings. And they show that priors other than a Gaussian prior can actually mitigate the cold posterior effect. And also uh, Masagosa in a paper in 2019 showed theoretically that if the model is misspecified, base is actually not optimal anymore. All right, uh, with that, I want to close the chapter on the cold posterior, but uh, if there are any questions about this line of work, I'm, I'm happy to take them now or later in the end of the talk. Okay, so if there are no questions for now, um, uh, let's talk about a different approach. Let's talk about um, ensembles. So here we are quite pragmatic and we just want to focus on getting the best possible results. And for that, uh, we have seen that um, deep ensembles are quite powerful. Um, in our work, we um, study hyperparameter ensembles, and this is joint work with Jasper Snoke, Dustin Kran, and Rodolf Jennetton from Google. Um, okay, so let's look at the plot from the beginning again. So here we had uh, looked at ImageNet examples, uh, and there were like corruptions applied to them. And we have seen that in this, um, that the calibration error increases when we increase the, the corruption intensity. Uh, but among all those methods, deep ensembles actually perform the best. So maybe it's a good idea to, to look at deep ensembles again. Um, ensembles over neural networks is actually quite a classical idea, which goes back to at least the early 90s, like this paper by Hansen and Salamon from 1990. And this idea was recently revisited by Balaji Lakshmi Narayanan um, 2017. Um, and they call their, their paper um, deep ensembles or like the, the methods they investigate. Um, and the idea is actually quite easy. So you just take your favorite deep learning, uh, you just take your favorite deep net architecture and you train it for a couple of different independent initializations. Um, and then you take those networks and predict uh, for new data independently. And finally, you combine all those independent predictions to form the ensemble prediction, which is essentially just averaging the probabilities. Um, so this works quite well in practice and improves um, accuracy and, and also robustness. But it's still an open question why deep ensembles work that well. In a recent paper by Ford at AL 2019, um, they showed that deep ensembles actually lead to different modes in the function space, whereas approximate Bayesian inference methods often just lead to one single mode and explore its vicinity. So they argue that deep ensembles leverage diversity stemming from different initializations, and that's why they work so well. So we, we ask, can we actually improve deep ensembles by leveraging other sources of diversity? 
Um, so uh, in our work, we propose a simple extension to deep ensembles, which we call hyper deep ensembles. So here's um, an overview of our pipeline. We, we start, or first we consider a, a, a deep net architecture with different hyperparameters, such as the L2 regularization parameter or a label smoothing parameter. And then we do a random search over those uh, hyperparameters. So we just train, let's say, 100 models using different hyperparameters. Um, then we take the k best models by using a greedy algorithm that optimizes the ensemble performance on a validation set. So we, we construct an optimal ensemble out of those 100 models um, they're directly on a validation set. So now we have k models. And for each model, we retrain the network for k different initializations. So now we end up with k squared models. So we have k different hyperparameters times k different initializations. So now we, we apply our greedy algorithm again and construct the, an optimal ensemble uh, of k models. And this gives us the final ensemble prediction. A similar um, model selection procedure was used in the, or is used in the outer ML community. Okay, let's see how it works, um, or how it works in practice. Uh, here we have a white ResNet 2810 architecture. We consider blockwise L2 regularization parameters and a label smoothing parameter. So in the end, we have six different hyperparameters. And we start with an initial random search over 100 models, and then we apply the pipeline I just showed. And as you can see, hyper deep ensembles significantly improve over deep ensembles. Um, so now a natural question is, do we actually need this um, greedy selection algorithm? Maybe we can just take the top K performing models and form an ensemble uh, based on them. And a similar idea was used in, in Zykia uh, at AL 2020. And here we, we um, uh, compared our approach to this top K idea uh, for a Lenet and an MLP on Cypher 10, uh, Cypher 100 and Fashion MNIST. And you can see that our 3D selection method actually leads to a significant improvement over those top K um, selection. And the reason for that, um, I guess, or we think is that, that our method works better because we are directly optimizing the ensemble performance. So this directly encourages diversity of the models. Okay, let's uh, look at, at some more results. We have uh, ResNet 20 and, and this white ResNet architecture. And we show uh, four different uh, performance metrics. We have the negative log likelihood, accuracy, expected calibration error, and diversity. So for diversity, there are different ways to, to compute a metric. So here we used um, the, the one used in Ford et al. So it basically measures the disagreement of the predictions of all those different models in the ensemble. And yeah, so hyper deep ensembles improve over deep ensembles on all of those metrics, and especially it leads to a more diverse ensemble. And similar results or tendencies can be uh, seen for CIFA 10. All right, uh, so we've seen that hyper deep ensembles lead to a nice performance improvement, but what is actually the additional price we have to pay? Um, so the training cost for a deep ensemble is O of K models. Uh, for hyper deep ensembles, we have to train K squared models. And also we have the uh, additional initial random search. Then the prediction cost and memory cost is the same because in both cases we have K, um, K models. Um, but for deep ensembles, there's actually an additional cost of, of tuning in the beginning. So we need uh, hyperparameters that work well. And in practice, we often do something similar like a random search in the beginning to find uh, a group of hyperparameters. And so from that perspective, we can argue um, 
that the costs are actually quite similar. Um, and, but more importantly, we will, I, I would like to take home uh, the idea that if you already perform the random search, maybe don't throw away all your models, but combine them uh, with our approach and you probably get a nice improvement. Okay, um, so we have seen deep ensembles and hybrid deep ensembles have great performance, but they are both quite expensive. So in many production scenarios, we can't afford to have multiple models uh, for uh, in memory for prediction. So maybe or we, we would like to have something which is uh, similar in runtime and memory, uh, similar to a single model. And so in the following, I want to show you an approach to, to capture the behavior of hybrid deep ensembles within one model. Um, so here's an overview. Um, so you don't have to, to get all the details for now. Um, our efficient approach is called hyperbatch ensemble. And the basic idea is to amortize um, the effect of a hyper deep ensemble in one model by using an amortized parameterization of the layers. Um, so this has uh, two ingredients. First, uh, we built on batch ensembles uh, by Van et al. 2019. So here the idea is to amortize the behavior of a deep ensemble. And we, here we use uh, um, a set of shared weights W, and then for each member of the deep ensemble, we have a rank one uh, matrix. Uh, and then the, the final um, weights of the layer are given by the uh, uh, Hadamard product of both. So this is actually quite, um, saves a lot of parameters because for each member, we only have to save those rank one weights instead of having a full independent weight matrix. And this parameterization also uh, enables vectorization, so it um, is, um, can be nicely implemented uh, in deep learning frameworks to lead to fast predictions. So this is uh, here now for, for dense layers, but a similar idea can be applied to convolutional layers. Okay, um, the second ingredient we use is self-tuning networks uh, by Mac McKay et al. 2019. Uh, here the idea is to approximate the behavior of different hyperparameters in the vicinity of a single hyperparameter. Um, so let's see what, what do we mean with that. Um, so let's look at this uh, simple loss like a uh, with just a squared loss and um, a, a two norm regularizer. So we would train this with SGD and we would get this solution theta star as function of the hyperparameter lambda one. On the right side, we take a different hyperparameter lambda two. Again, we optimize the loss and we get a solution theta star of, uh, as function of lambda two. Now the question is, can we track how those SGD solutions changes given different hyperparameters? And the idea is to, to come up with a model uh, the, of theta of lambda. And we plug in this model into the loss and we also learn it simultaneously to the model parameters. And the, the loss we will get is an expectation over a distribution over the hyperparameters P of lambda. Okay, so this is the basic uh, motivation. And using this, we can, um, you know, uh, look, look at our dense layer parameterization again, and we just um, add this E of lambda, which is um, like an embedding model that maps the hyperparameters to the weights uh, which is uh, which are connected to this set of of hyper uh, sorry it, it maps the uh, weights of the layer to a certain hyperparameter. So now if we change the lambda, we would get the weights according to different hyperparameters. Okay, so 
um, let's see uh, how we combine those ideas to, to come up with the hyper batch ensemble parameterization. Uh, here, the idea is that we want to capture the behavior of multiple hyperparameters, uh, which form the ensemble. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so in the end, we just combine those both ideas um, and to let's see how we actually um, get the ensemble output. So here we would take for each um, member, we would have this member specific weights theta k. And then we also have a member specific hyperparameter lambda k. And then we take the uh, typical average over the um, soft maxes. So this would be the ensemble output. And, and the training would be that we alternate between optimizing the model parameters and the hyperparameters. Okay. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, so let's look at the um, training step first. So here we optimize the model parameters. And for that, we just take our initial standard uh, uh, loss function, the average member cross entropy. You could also take the ensemble cross entropy, but we found that the average member cross entropy works uh, better. And then we have a regularizer, which could be also a function of the hyperparameters. So this is actually just the standard uh, training objective you would have for a single model and you kind of just train them independently. Or like this step is performed uh, for each model independently. But in the um, hyperparameter optimization step, um, we take the ensemble cross entropy. So now the, the hyperparameters are optimized on a Directly, we take a distribution over hyperparameters, uh, QT of lambda, um, and then we optimize the parameters of this distribution. So we found that a log uniform distribution works best, and then we optimize the two, two uh, parameters of the log uniform distribution. Okay, so, and the final objective would be this expected ensemble cross entropy and an entropy term which prevents the collapse of the uh, hyperparameter distribution to a, to a direct data. Okay, so this was like a, a lot of detail. So it's not important if you get got like everything out of here. So the high picture would be that we have this amortized um, parameterization and we have, um, uh, we, we can change the model parameters and the hyperparameters. And to optimize it, we alternate uh, between optimizing the model parameters on a training set and optimizing the hyperparameters on a validation set. And the, um, as you can see here, we are, uh, typically uh, start with the quite broad hyperparameter distribution. And um, during training, this distribution becomes narrow and um, uh, gives you, in the end, a certain set of hyperparameters which form the final ensemble. All right, uh, so like a similar training procedure is used in um, self-tuning networks. Okay, let's look at some results again. Um, here we have a ResNet20 and a right ResNet2810 again. Um, and you can see that the hyper batch ensemble improves over the batch ensemble on, on all those metrics. Uh, this is on Cypher 100 and also on, on Cypher 10. Um, and also in terms of uh, robustness, uh, we, we uh, produced a plot similar to the plots I've shown in the beginning. So here we consider Cypher 10 corruptions. On the x-axis, we have the corruption intensity and on the y-axis, the accuracy. Um, and you can see that uh, like for, for our hyper batch ensembles, we typically get uh, or we get better worst case accuracies. So it leads to less extreme errors. And also for the expectation cali expected calibration error, we get less extreme mistakes or like bad values. All right. Um, 
So this were uh, <clears throat> hyper parameter ensembles. Uh, now I would like to conclude and end with an outlook on future research. Uh, so in the first part, we talked about uh, cold posteriors. We showed that it actually works quite well in practice, but it still deviates from the Bayesian paradigm. And we argue that it's important to understand this effect to, to make progress with BMNs. Uh, we put forward uh, several hypotheses that could explain the cold posterior effect uh, and we didn't get a conclusive answer in the end but we found that there are like a lot of work to be done to improve priors. Um, in the second part we talked about hyperparameter ensembles and we showed that leveraging hyperparameter diversity improves ensembles and I've shown you two methods, hyper-deep ensembles, which could be considered as a quite expensive upper bound uh, um, baseline. And if you care about efficiency, you can use our hyper-batch ensembles. Um, so all the code is available um, in open source. So the, for the code posterior work, we have a GitHub repository uh, which is a general purpose SGMCMC uh, inference framework for BNNs. So we have a couple of different inference uh, uh, methods in there, different evaluation statistics and diagnostics, and it's built on top of TensorFlow and Keras, so it's hopefully easy to use. And the hyperparameter ensembles code is part of uncertainty baselines, which is a Google uh, repository uh, where we have a um, couple of different state-of-the-art uncertainty methods. And the purpose of this repository is to have like really clean um, implementations. So it's easy to work on top of that. And it also comes with a table uh, uh, which compares the performance and runtime and so on uh, between all those methods. Um, and the, the layer code for the hyper-batch ensembles can be found in Edward 2 which is a probabilistic programming language uh, on top of TensorFlow. Um, and so here we, we try to come up with a simple as possible uh, implementation. So you can take your, your already existing uh, Keras or TensorFlow deep nets and just replace the layers by our hyper batch ensemble layers. And, and you can see if you, if you get some improvements. So let me end with some future research ideas. Um, so first, I think there's a lot of work to be done to understand BNNs better and the cold posterior effect. In general, in general I think it's um, interesting to explore uh, new deep net architectures that are better suited for basic inference. So I guess SGD and all the optimization methods co-evolved with, with the deep net architectures. And so maybe we should uh, go one step back and um, actually look for architectures that probably work better with sampling. Um, also, I think it's important to design better priors, uh, especially priors that reflect the knowledge about our downstream tasks we want to apply our BNN to. So for example, if we care about out of distribution robustness, we probably should try to come up with a prior that encourage uncertainty away from the data. Another interesting line of research could be to embrace the cold posterior effect and just try to come up with an efficient algorithm which simultaneously to sampling optimizes the temperature. And for the second part of the talk, I think um, interesting research direction is to study other sources of diversity. So we have studied um, diversity coming from different initializations and different hyperparameters. But you could also study ensembles uh, of networks of different architectures. You could even use different optimizers for, for each member or if different loss functions. Uh, so in general, I think it would be quite um, interesting to understand better how diversity um, is connected to, to all those um, techniques and how it translates into better performance. 
Um, all right, so with that, uh, I would like to end here and I'm happy to take your questions now. Uh, I can't hear you, Stefan, I guess you're muted. Thank you. All right, Florian, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, it was very inspiring and um, I'm sure there are questions. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, you can either directly, um, you know, speak up. I think we're a small audience. Or if you're more comfortable, you can also just type your question into the chat and I'll just read your question. Um, so maybe let me let me get started and ask the first question. So, um, um, you know, when you compare variational inference in deep learning and full MCMC in deep learning, let's forget about the cold posterior effect for once for, for one second. Is there, is there kind of a clear performance advantage of stochastic gradient MCMC over variational inference? Or do you have any intu intuition about which, which correlations are actually important between the different parts of a deep network? Or are they important at all? Um, yeah, good question. So I guess, I mean, it's still an active research field and uh, I'm, I'm still a fan of variational inference. So I hope they they also will catch up, but I guess in, in most of the recent work, variation inference didn't work that well, at least for, for large uh, Bayesian uh, neural network architectures. And I guess it's not so much about uh, like the mean field assumption you typically use. So it's probably not so much about the correlation of the weights. I guess it's more connected to the findings of um, what I've shown in the beginning of the, the diversity of ensembles. So like in this paper by Ford et al, uh, it's like a, called a loss landscape perspective on, on, on deep nets or something like this. Um, and they show that it's actually important to, to explore different modes uh, instead of just, you know, approximating one mode uh, perfectly. And I guess variational inference typically, I mean, depends on the variational distribution, but typically you use a unimodal variational distribution. And even if you use a Gaussian with a full covariance matrix, you just approximate one mode quite well. And I guess it's more important to combine models from different modes instead of approximating one mode better. Mm -hmm. And that's why I guess those sampling methods work better, I guess they are worse in approximating uh, one mode, but still they mix better between different modes. All right, any other I questions? A, I have a question. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Um, instead of having priors over the weights themselves, has there been any work on having priors directly in function space, kind of like a Gaussian process? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I guess an interesting research direction. Um, there is some initial work on that, but I mean, I guess it's not a, it's like just some, some first attempts, I would say. So you mentioned Gaussian processes. Um, so this would be a natural starting point. And there, there is some work trying to connecting, uh, like you, you would start with a GP prior and trying to, to connect that to a VNN. So what kind of prior would that induce in the weight space? Um, or can we actually even don't look at the weight space and trying to directly um, work with this um, GP prior formulation? And there are, I guess, also some other works trying to come up with different ways of formulating function space priors. But in the end, uh, inference is always quite challenging. Um, and yeah, so I guess there's still some work to be done. But I mean, I, I fully agree. I guess it's much better to actually focus on the function space perspective because it's much easier to, to formulate your ideas about, about the data and function space. I mean, nobody knows how, how a reasonable weight vector of you know, millions of parameters should look like, but it's much easier to come up with ideas how, how the functions would look like. <clears throat> Any more questions? For I had a question about the hyper deep um, ensembles. So you had this particular approach of, of um, <coughs> K models, and then you expanded to K squared and selected back to K. 
I mean, I understand why sort of optimizing uh, predictive performance would be good, but is this particular structure kind of motivated by theory or was just, was this more of a, uh, an idea that seemed to kind of work well in practice? Um, yeah, as I, like the initial motivation was that we wanted to study this uh, different source different sources of diversity, like in this case, the um, diversity coming from different initializations and from different hyperparameters. Um, so, so if you look at uh, uh, row here, you have uh, like uh, the same, but let's look at, uh, let, let's look at the column first. This would be essentially a deep ensemble. So you have uh, the same hyperparameter, but different initializations. And if you look at the row, you have the same initialization, but different hyperparameters. And so we wanted to entangle the effect of those two sources of diversity. So in the paper, we compare our method against a row and also against the column. And we show that actually having both, so the full uh, uh, square works much better. So there's actually um, an orthogonal effect of those both sources of diversity. Um, I and, see. Is, and that's is like the, one better than the more important than the other, the uh, the initialization versus the hyperparameters. That would you or or, or are they really um, if, important? Yeah, I mean, if you just take one of, uh, if I call, recall correctly, I guess having different initializations is more important than having different hyperparameters. But as you can see, if you use both, you get still a, quite a nice boost. And okay. so like the mo motivation was more to study this effects and not so much to come up with a practical algorithm. But in the end, as, as we argue, it's actually still quite practical. Um, as, as I mean, you still have some additional cost, but sometimes you can afford to, to train k squared models instead of k models. But I guess you could still make this a bit more efficient if you uh, if you care about efficiency. <coughs> okay, thank you. All right. So maybe there's one more one last question here by Audong. Um, so he's asking about the table of diversity measures um, and how diversity measures are defined in this table. Okay, let me jump to the slide. Um, so uh, let's let's start with where's my mouse? Yeah. Anyways, ah, here it is. Okay. Um, so let's start with the, this diversity metric here. So here's the formula. Um, so you have you have an ensemble of different members, and you want to compute the diversity of those members. So you take for each member, you compute the predictions, and then you can just look at the labels and compute the fraction of disagreement, how much percent uh, of the predictions were different. This is this first term here, and then you normalize it by the error rate, which is just a convention to, to do. So the more the disagreement on the predictions, the higher uh, the diversity measure here. Um, and I mean, the other metrics are not directly diversity measures. I guess diversity is kind of co correlated to the other metrics, mostly, uh, I guess, to uh, the negative log likelihood. Yeah, but, and there are different diversity metrics, which we haven't shown here. Like you could also look at diversity of the weight, met, met, uh, weight vectors, like having, for example, cosine similarity of, of the weight met, uh, matrix and so on. But most of those diversity metrics are quite correlated and I guess it's still an open problem what the best diversity metric is. <clears throat> all right. Well, thank you, Florian, again, for answering all of our questions and for giving a great presentation. And I look forward to catching up with you soon. Yes, me too. Uh, thanks for having me. It was great. And sorry for my bad internet connection. I hope you could uh, still get something out of it. No problem. It's good.